Please be seated. And I'll mention to the music staff, I think I left the wrong, I left the old hymn from last week in. Isn't that what we sang last week? You can fix it? Good. I just wanted to make you aware of that and make all of us aware of that. Oh. Let's begin this sermon time with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious God, we pray that the words of Jake and my mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable to you, O God, who is both our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this is the third week of this part of the sermon series, the state of the church, the fate of the church. And as you may recall, the last couple of weeks and through August, we are having uh, folks who are 40 and under offer uh, their words of what they see the future of the church is. Richard Hinkleman graced us the first week with a powerful reminder that scripture tells us what we need to be in the future. Uh, last week, uh, Jesse Bessner challenged us to expand our welcome beyond just our own faith tradition. Uh, and today we have uh, the glorious privilege of having Jake Pruitt uh, to join us. Uh, Jake is, I think, the first of the new visioning team members to actually speak in front of us. I know we'll have at least one other new visioning team member speak. Uh, but let me move aside and invite Jake to come forward and share with us his understanding of the future of the church. I probably couldn't have been in the 
choir, and I most definitely would not have been allowed to be a member of that church or partake in communion. And I've talked before as a communion witness about what it's like to be in a congregation and know, even if the pastor doesn't know you personally and you can get away with it, you know you're not supposed to take communion. And there are many, many churches and entire denominations that say, for whatever reason, you may not take communion. Jessica is heterosexual and has no problem with homosexuals. But if she had come out in this church as gay, whether she was 5, 15, or even if she does when she's 25, nothing in her relationship with any of you would change. Nothing with her relationship at church, with her family, would change because that's the environment that we have here. And I couldn't help but think about the huge contrast in the two environments from where I grew up versus where Jessica grew up and how there are so many, many, many more young people and adults who are in the same position that I was for 20 some years, where you feel like a fraud in the place where you're supposed to feel the most at home. There are a growing number of churches like Franklin Circle that whether they are in writing open and affirming or if they're just welcoming and turn a blind eye and it's not our job, despite what some people might say on the news, whether it's left or right, it's not our job, it's not our intention to change the mission statement of any other church or any other denomination. That's not what Franklin Circle is about. That's not what the Disciples of Christ is about. I think that will eventually come with our interactions as we all go out into the world and we share our life and what we feel and how we know God with other people. That's going to affect them. And whatever church they're in, they're going to go in and they're going to affect change where they're in. That's not our job to change these other churches. Our job is to be as vocal as possible about who we are, what we believe, and who we know God to be. We need to show the world that there are other options. There is no condemnation in our church for anything. We need to let people know and speak up because there are so many loud people who don't believe what we believe and that's all anybody hears of. And what I feel the future of the church is, is not only going out and we've all been raised, you go out and witness to the quote unquote lost. There's a lot of lost people who already know God that don't come into church, whether it's this one or another one. And we need to start being just as vocal as everybody else about going out and not just finding the lost soul that we've heard so much about, but all the people who have been turned away and rejected, they're still looking for a church home. I was looking for a church home. I didn't think I could go to church anywhere and hear the Bible. And I was raised to believe if you went to a church with, you know, where all those homos and homo lovers went, they didn't preach the word of God. Well, I haven't heard anything but the word of God in this church, thank God. So we need to show the other side that there are options out there. And I'm going to tread lightly because I know this is kind of a harsh topic for some people. And this is the man you want to see about theology. I'm not a theologist. I don't pretend to be. I don't want to be. This is not a call to universalist theology. But we need to shut up about hell. Whether it's about homosexuality, whether it's about whether you're living with somebody and you're not married and you're having sex or you've had children out of wedlock, in the most strict holiness churches where you have to jump through the hoops and do the hokey pokey and put your left foot in and your left foot out. We need to shut up about hell because even in those churches, it's still ultimately God's decision. Whether you believe in hell, you don't believe in hell, whether you believe in a particular path to heaven or not, it's not going to be your decision who's going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell. So we can, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, tear all that out of the Bible and don't ever talk about it, don't ever learn about it, but it's not our job. We are not in the business of condemnation. We are in the business of loving. So we need to not be hesitant to share what we believe who we believe in, 
and the fact that we love everybody the way that we're called to love everybody because that's who God loves. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to love the world and to show us how to love each other. So we shouldn't be hesitant to let people know we have well-spoken people like Richard who are grounded in the word of God. We shouldn't be hesitant to let people know that we have crazy pastors who let people like me come up and talk. <laughs> and we shouldn't be hesitant to raise our children in an environment and our young adults and even people who have never been in a church that might be in the Middle Ages or older. We need to let them know we're here and that we stand for God and they have a welcome place here. We need to bring not only the lost sheep in, we need to bring in the people who have been a part of church and feel like they don't have a place. That's all I got. Well, we could end there. <laughs> But we're not going to. <laughs> right, you're right. I've got a ways to go. So. I'm going to have a little conversation, as uh, is my want to do during these. Um, that was really very, very uh, stunning and, and uh, quite well spoken. You kept referring to Richard and Jesse as being well spoken. I think we have another wow. very well spoken person here. image of the church. Mm -hmm. And as I was pondering on this uh, before and now, what kept coming to my mind is, I, I hear you say that really the church, or at least the church as Franklin Circle exhibits the church, has a PR problem. Mm. Uh, an, an, an image problem. Understatement. Understatement, yes. <laughs> and, and you lifted up that a lot of people out in the world um, come with dare I say, baggage, or at least come with a set image of what church is for their childhood. Mm -hmm. You're talking about your, not necessarily a negative one all mm -hmm. the time, but certainly a confining one. Right. Okay. And then I think it's also fair enough to say that there are a lot of people who don't come into the church that see what happens on the news and in the media, and they think that that's church. Mm -hmm. um, either it's frivolous and doesn't really relate to them, or it's mean-spirited, or they hear about all the fights that are going on. So there are two PR problems. What we bring to the church as children, or what we see in the church and the media. Would you agree? I would agree. And we have to kind of work on those. Well, this last week, I want to tell a little story, because I think there's another PR problem. Okay. This last week, Craig's sister, Colleen, uh, and his great nephew, her grandson, Josh, <coughs> and, and thank you for sending Josh birthday wishes. He, he's nine years old. And he likes tacos. And he likes tacos, a lot. <laughs> um, well, in the midst of all the things that Craig and uh, Colleen and Josh did, uh, touristy-wise, around the city, they dropped by one day and came to church. And they came up and met me, and they did a quick tour of the church, and it was fascinating we came into this space. And Colleen was asking some questions, and Craig and I were talking a little bit about the history of the church. And Craig and I both began to notice Josh, who had his iPod uh, uh, camera, was taking pictures incessantly of little details of everything. And he kept asking questions. What's that? What's that? What's that? And he pointed to the communion table, and he said, what's that? And I was completely off my game. It's like, what's that? I said, that's a communion table. What's that? Well, a communion table is where we, uh, where we share bread and we share grape juice to remember Jesus. Who's that? Wow. And then I said, in my most eloquent of words, <laughs> he's a guy we follow. <laughs> That's what you pay this guy for. <laughs> He's a guy we follow. Well, my, my point being um, is that there are also a lot and more and more people out there who have no experience with the church. And 
and what was fascinating was Craig and my conversation afterwards, because at first my instinct was, oh, how sad, how horrible. But then as we talked a little bit more, I realized, what a great opportunity. There are people in this world that don't have all this baggage about church. We should speak up and let them know there are churches like this where God's will is being done and Jesus' love is alive. Let's take that opportunity. I mean, we could worry about it or we could try and explain, well, Josh, the, ch the church has really not always been the best place. In the we, we could do all that kind of stuff and maybe drag him through the mud. Or we could just say, this is how, it, this is how God loves. See these amazing people? So I think when you challenge us for the, the church of the future is to recognize that people out there come with a lot of different images of church or no image at all. And we need to speak up in order to name and claim that. Was that fair enough? Fair enough. Okay, great. And I think you gave us some good words and some good images. And even your, your own life is something we should be sharing with folks. Okay, so that's kind of the first thing. The church is a PR problem. And then I was really pleased when you picked John 3.17. Um, partly because John 3.16, which I just love, for God so loved the world that he did not, that he sent his only begotten son into the world, um, is a beautiful text, but it's used as a clobber passage sometimes. You know, it's, it's used, you know, to kind of create this, this hoop and say, jump through this, and then you can be in the church. And you pick the next verse, which really fills it out. And I just love that, that you picked, um, uh, reminding us that all this, the, 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 this Christ thing that God created uh, was ultimately for love and no other thing. And, and kind of related to that, I really appreciate the fact that you call us to be um, clear about the fact that we believe and proclaim the Bible as much as anybody. Mm -hmm. um, would, you, would you say it's fair enough that the kind of negative or narrow voices of the world have kind of made it seem that theirs is the only way to interpret the Bible? Absolutely. Okay. That's how I was raised to someone. Okay. I know it exists. And, and it seems to be even still today that really the, the, the loudest voice is this voice that's very narrow and very negative. And so I think we need to kind of get, get our gumption together and be able to say, we proclaim Christ and Christ proudly and lovingly. Um, and it looks very different. And let's tell you why. I mean, I would like to think that every sermon I've done here, I mean, you gave me a lot of credit, but every sermon I've done here, every newsletter article, everything proclaims this Christ that is welcoming, this God that is embracing um, that's, you know, this ever-expanding understanding of, of God, and it's all biblically based. And there's amazing scholars and uh, theologians in our congregation and in the world. We, we need to not give up that ground. We do not need to, to cower. Because I think sometimes, uh, I call myself a good liberal. Um, and sometimes we good liberals think, well, that means everybody should have an equal voice. We need to make sure, I need, we need to listen to the negatives as well as the positives. And what ends up happening is the negatives are really loud and really angry and really you have media uh, tied up. Um, and we need to be able to say, no, no, we're not going to let the negative voices have the final word on this. Because I don't think that's the gospel of Christ. So uh, we should be saying this is a Bible-believing church. And not, it might be other people's language, I don't care. We are a Bible-believing church, and, and by you naming that and, and using a great scripture text kind of reminds us of that. So, agreed? Agreed. Okay. Because part of, part of this process is for you to say, no, Alan, Pastor Alan, you ain't got it. No, I 100% I agree because I think that we need to not only be just as passionate as the negative voices and just as loud because... For better or worse, the society we live in, the polar opposites and the extremists are the ones who are going to be on the news. So we need to be extreme about what we believe. If we really believe it, we need to be extreme. Not to condemn the other people, but to be just as extreme and loud and passionate about the fact that we do serve a God who loves everybody. 
as anybody who can be negative, but we also need to remember not everybody watches the news and some people are disgusted with it. And we do need those quiet voices who are going to go whisper to somebody who's going to lurk in the shadows. Um, they're both important. But yeah, we do need to start speaking up and talking to them. Um, I may have used this image before, but I heard someone say that they felt that Jacqueline Kennedy was actually a louder voice than John Kennedy because she was so quiet and seemingly demure that whenever she spoke, people really listened. Uh, and that she, you, she understood that power and used that power wisely because everybody knew the president was going to speak. Everybody knew the president was going to make proclamations. But in that moment when they were at a, an event and Jacqueline Kennedy stood up and spoke, everybody got quiet because they didn't hear her so much. So those quiet voices could be powerful voices too. Okay, and then the final thing I want to talk about is, um, and this you talked a little bit more about in our conversation when you came by this last week. Um, tell us a little bit more about, um, you obviously have focused on the particular welcome you have as a gay person. Um, but you challenged me this week that we shouldn't be complacent with that. Do you want to say just a little bit more about how there are other, other things that we need to be advocating for, other people that we need to be voices for? Well, yeah, just, uh, um, just that uh, this congregation has the possibility of becoming complacent, thinking, oh, well, we've done all of our work because we're open and affirming. Yeah. Um, when I first started, I, I wrote this thing out every day at my lunch break for work, and I never actually ended up using what I wrote out. So um, I've been over this a few times, so forgive me, but it took me a while to remember what he was talking about. But there's a tendency to say, well, we're already pro-reconciling, so we don't have to worry about talking to black people or trying to go out into the, uh, the streets and talk to black people. And we're already accessible, so you know, we don't have to worry about the handicap caucus. Is that word right? Caucus. Go for it. At any rate, um, we're already open and affirming, so you know, what do we need to do? I mean, we've already done everything that we need to do. We're not done. There's still work to be done because We've done what we could to get all these faces that are in here to feel comfortable and welcome. And it's great to come in here and give each other an attaboy or an attagirl and say, you know, we're doing the good work. And that, I mean, that's Alan's job is to come in and tell us that we're doing good and to uplift us on Sunday. But we also need to challenge each other to say, what about those two cues that are right here that are empty? Who could be in there? And why don't they feel they can be here? Are we here too early? Are we here too late? Do they not feel the church is for them because they're black or they're white or they're Hispanic? And I don't think that that work is ever going to end and I don't think it should happen. And I think that we should always be striving to go out and share not just the good news of Jesus Christ, um, as we're called to in the Bible, and that's what we're, we're raised constantly. When people talk about witness, they talk about you know, some, some places there's a, a particular path and a formula and stuff like that. And we don't, I'm not saying we should go away from that, but we also need to remember our focus needs to be on letting people know, you know, not only are we out there talking to, you know, they might see me talk to you and you're a white middle class male, but they also need to know that it doesn't matter if he's a white middle class male or he's a black middle class male. God's going to love either one of them just the same because they're his children. And we don't turn people away for any reason. And until we don't have room to fit anybody in here, we should never stop inviting people to come. Well, I have two sides of that in response. One is my kind of activist side. I've been, I've been doing this open and affirming ministry stuff for 25 some odd years. I've been intentional about my anti-racism work for about 15 years. And it's only since I've come to this congregation that I've really taken on what it means to be an accessible congregation in your heart as well as in your building and so forth. And the first side of me says, oh my God, I'm so tired. <laughs> you know, I can't possibly do another, you know, who, who out there, let some other congregation deal with, you know, folks who are dealing with this issue or that issue. Uh, and and, and I, I, I hear the words from Galatians 6, 9, it says, do not be weary in well doing. Uh, that reminds us that, yes, it's okay to take a moment of rest. Yes, it's okay to have a, a little Sabbath leave. But really, the work of the gospel <coughs> is ongoing. And 
Um, and what I have found is when I get over that and I actually do find an, another cause or another person who doesn't feel welcome and I, and I, I that I become renewed through that, you know? Um, Craig and I tell the story again and again and again. 20 years ago, we went to Lexington, Kentucky uh, to do a speaking circuit with the First uh, Christian Church and the Ministerial Alliance there. And, you know, we were, uh, I like to say we were on a promo homo tour. Um, <laughs> telling people, you know, it's okay, you're not, your church isn't going to fall down whenever you accept the people, people blah, blah, blah. Well, we were graced by the hospitality of a beautiful older woman. Uh, who had been to several of the events. I had spoken, I think, to the Women's Fellowship and to the church board or something like that. Well, we sat down to have some wine at the end of the day and just kind of chat around. And it was clear she had something on her heart and mind, and she began to open up. And Craig and I thought, you know, she's going to ask us more about what it means to be gay, and, you know, she's going to ask us some, you know, personal questions. And no, she needed to tell us that within the last month, she had just... Um, admitted her husband to an institution because his Alzheimer's got so bad that he was becoming a threatening presence in the house and dangerous to himself. And she felt so much shame for having had to admit her husband against his will into uh, this facility that she didn't feel like she could talk about it at church. And here she saw Craig and Alan talking about this kind of intimate thing about their, their human sexuality, and that opened her up to talk about, she had nothing to do with sexuality, it had all to do with this, this need to be heard. And so what I realize is that when we open the door a little, we need to be ready to open the door a lot. Because every one of us have hurts and pains. Every one of us have felt excluded at one time or another, in one situation or another. Uh, and when we see someone else welcome into a really cool place, we want to be welcome there too. And so we just have to, you know, it's, it's the work of the gospel. And I think that's what Jesse was trying to tell us last week. He was, Jesus was working so hard to open up, you know, to the lost house, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And here comes this Canaanite woman who says, no, the door's open. I need into. Uh, and, and, and we need to be hearing that. So, so you're challenging our church then to not become complacent with the wonderful things we've already done. Uh, but to realize that the work of the gospel is on. Any last words? Okay. <laughs> Thanks be to God for Jake Pruitt and for his vision of the church. And if you want to be a church, part of a church that follows this Jesus who is always uh, opening doors and expanding boundaries and uh, doing unimaginable crazy things, you want to give your life to this Jesus. Uh, we invite you to come forward during the singing of our final hymn, but let us all stand and renew our faith uh, as we are able.